before I start my lecture on what is the Constitution, what functions performed by the U.S. Constitution, I also want to mention to you that we're going to be learning new concepts. The ones that you learned when I was lecturing on what is a political system, and now new concepts. Also, this assignment sheet. There are two articles in today's New York Times. Number one, city, meaning New York City wants a smoking ban on beaches. And a second article, polls suggest opportunities for both parties in midterm elections. You are to do journal summaries on both those articles for next week. You're going to be handing your journal in tomorrow. I will read your first journal summary and grade it. I will hand it back to you on Monday. It will be downstairs, all graded with my comments. You can pick it up on Monday. If you want to wait till class on Tuesday, that's fine. But by the end of next week, you should have two more journal entries, which will mean you should have three by the end of next week. Now, it's important that you have access to the New York Times. And most of you, I think, in this class have either signed up to get it individually or you're going in with one or two other people. Make sure that's done. Also, for Monday by 12 o'clock, be on this list. I want you to summarize for me how can the United States Constitution be amended. You can either go online for that or just go to your textbook. How can we amend the United States Constitution? It's a process. Remember I talked to you about process? Since it's a constitutional amendment process, what are the stages in the process and who are the key participants in the process? It doesn't have to be very long. But it's a rather complicated process. So I think this will help you. I was going to assign this at a later date, but since I'm lecturing on the United States Constitution, I thought it would be an appropriate time to do that. Any questions or comments? Yes? What exactly has to be in the journal? Just the key concepts? You're going to have to, if you were here the very first day of class, I told you that it has to be about two pages in length. Yep. I told you you have to summarize the key facts and details. Right. So it has to be the key facts and details. And as you're doing that, you have to identify the concepts. Now, what I would recommend is that if you write a sentence, and you say in your mind, William, that it's leadership selection, at the end of that sen sentence put, leadership selection in brackets. Don't have a, uh, a separate section for concepts. Incorporate the concepts as you summarize the article. Put the concepts at the end of a sentence. Put the concepts at the end of the first paragraph. And the reason I'm having you do this one is I want to see how people are doing it so that I can get the grades back to you and I can tell you what you're doing right and doing wrong. If you have any questions and want to go over some of this, I'm done with class at 11 o'clock. I'll be available to 1 o'clock. And if you want to meet with me at 2.30, <coughs> I have a half hour then. So if anybody wants to go over anything related to the journals, and again, remember, they must be in tomorrow by 11 or 12 o'clock. If they're not in, you're going to get a zero grade. You're not going to hand it in over the weekend <coughs> or on Monday because I'm going to start grading the journals uh, on Friday, get them done uh, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. That's my schedule. Come Monday, I don't want to be reading any of your journals. Okay, let's get to the lecture on what is the United States Constitution? What functions does the Constitution perform? First of all, the Constitution is the fundamental law of the nation. That's an important word. 
the Constitution is the fundamental law of the nation. I looked up the word fundamental today in the dictionary, and there was just two aspects to it. Determining essential structure and function. Essential structure and function. Number two, of central importance. The Constitution as the fundamental law of the land is of central importance. If you think of all of the legal documents we have, the U.S. Constitution, state constitutions, treaties, laws made by Congress, laws made by state legislature, the highest legal fundamental document is the United States Constitution. No other legal entity can come in conflict with what is in the Constitution. So if a state law or a state constitution violates the U.S. Constitution, the state constitutional provision or the state law is null and void. If Congress passes a law and someone challenges that law and says that law violates the segment of the Constitution and the court rules that the law is unconstitutional <coughs> because it violates this fundamental law, the highest legal entity of the nation. Now, the Constitution contains our most fundamental values and principles. The Constitution contains fundamental values and principles related to our democratic political system. Constitution, fundamental principles and values related to our democratic political system. Now, let's look at the functions performed by our Constitution, our U.S. Constitution. First of all, our Constitution has symbolic value. <coughs> now, what the heck does that mean? How does our Constitution have symbolic value? Take a look at this. This is why I want you to have this handy. Let's take a look at this. By the way, what would be the fundamental law of the state of New York? What would be the fundamental law of the state of New York? Anyone? The New York State Constitution. Every state, 50 states, have state constitutions. And for every state as a political system, the Constitution would, for that state government, would be the most fundamental legal entity. But for the United States, it's the U.S. Constitution. Now, take a look. On page one, you have the Constitution of the United States. You see where you have the Constitution of the United States? We the people of the United States, now follow along because I want you to identify what these words mean. These are words that give the Constitution this symbolic value. We the people of the United States in order to do what? To form a more perfect union, establish, etc., etc., etc. Now I'm going to get back to that. I'm going to get back to that. We, the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union, the 13 states and the people of those 13 states were forming a new political system. So the first symbolic value, it is creating a people within a new political system. It was uniting the American people.
people into a new political system, a new, more perfect union. Okay? That's the symbolic value. You read, and what you were just reading, what I was just reading, was the preamble to the U.S. Constitution. Now, who is creating this Constitution? We, the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union, okay, and the values that go along with that. Now, what else does the preamble do? Explains what they're doing. Besides forming or uniting the American people into this more perfect union, the preamble says that this more perfect union will establish what? Justice. Justice. What are the ends of government? Why are we creating this more perfect union? What are we wanting to do? Bring about injustice? Inequality? We're saying that our new political system, the new 13 states, the United States of America, uniting all of the people in the 13 states, want to establish justice. And what I want you to write down, these are some ends of government reasons why we were forming a more perfect union. What did we want our governmental institutions to achieve for this new political system under this Constitution? Establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility. What's domestic tranquility? What do you think domestic tranquility is? Law and order. Law and order. A peaceful society. One based on law and order. Internal security. Why create government? Okay? Establish justice. We're going to try, attempt to achieve that value of justice. We want government to ensure law and order. Domestic tranquility. Provide for what? The common defense. The role of the national government to defend us against what? Other nations. National security. Provide for the common descent. Promote the general welfare. Boy, what does that mean to promote the general welfare? What did it mean back then? And what does it mean today? Boy, government has all kinds of programs and policy goals. Education, roads, recreation. I mean, promote, provide, promote the general welfare. What were you going to say? Well, governments back then, we didn't have welfare programs. Back then, if somebody was poor, it was generally church groups that provided most of the kind of welfare programs. Uh, it had a very limited meaning back then. Government didn't do what it does today. Government has expanded, and this is one of the areas of great expansion. What does it mean to promote the general welfare? clean air, clean water, good food, drugs. I mean, you go into all of these policy areas where government is now involved to promote the general welfare. And secure the blessings of what? Liberty. What are our liberties, our freedoms? When we get to the Bill of Rights, the first ten amendments to the Constitution, <coughs> freedom of speech, freedom of the press, freedom to petition your government against the redress of grievances, Freedom of religion. The First Amendment talks about freedom. Uh, what do we have in the harbor of New York City? The statue of what? Liberty. liberty. What, what, what are our specific freedoms? We talk about liberty. We talk about freedom. And there are, in the document, many of these specific freedoms are spelled out. So there's the preamble. Uniting the American people in this new political system. Also, it does set forth some what? Ends of government. Why was government created? Or sometimes I refer to what is in the preamble as values. Democratic values of justice. Democratic values of liberty. Democratic values of 
protecting our nation against foreign enemies, providing law and order at home. Any questions so far? Third, and boy, number three is going to be a new concept. We've already touched upon it, but we haven't used this particular phraseology. Who's creating the new constitution? We the people. We have talked in class about where do elected leaders get their authority and how many, what have you said? What, where do our elected leaders get their authority from? We the people. L listen to the preamble. We the people of the United States in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare, and secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity, do ordain and establish this Constitution. We the people of the United States do ordain and establish this Constitution. The power is coming from the people. The, the concept that I want you to understand is called popular popular sovereignty. Who has popular sovereignty? Who? You. You have popular sovereignty. What is this notion? What do I have? That's the first time anybody ever told me I have popular sovereignty. How do you use it? By election when you vote, you transfer your popular sovereignty to the winner of the election. And he has that popular sovereignty until when? The next election. Remember I gave you that little example when we were talking about leadership selection and interest identification. And I said, well, your mother calls you the day after the election and says, well, what did you do uh, yesterday? And you say, well, mom, uh, I engaged in leadership selection and interest identification, right? Remember how I use that? Uh, I try to be consistent in both my classes. Well, now you can say, Mom, uh, I engaged in leadership selection, <coughs> interest identification, and I transferred my popular sovereignty to, and your mother would say, well, what are you talking about? What is that? What you, yeah, that's what it is. Now, when you read an article, and it talks about the voters, in the general election. You could put two concepts, leadership selection and what's the next concept? Popular sovereignty. You're right, William, we'll go back to, you're reading this article and it talks about uh, the voters uh, in an upcoming general election. A public opinion polls show that the voters uh, support candidate X. You write that. You say leadership selection, interest identification, and popular sovereignty. You will have three concepts at the end of that sentence. Now it gets a little tricky because <laughs> you're only writing your first journal entry. And I've been teaching this for so long and it's second nature to me. I told you when I read articles now, I read for content. As I'm reading, I'm identifying concepts. <coughs> just the way it is and it will really help you understand and give some comprehension to what you're reading. So popular sovereignty. The people have the ultimate authority. That's what it means. The definition of sovereignty is the people have the ultimate authority. Now listen to this. To create their government. What were they doing with this Constitution? Were they creating a more perfect union? So popular sovereignty, sovereignty allow the voters, the citizens, who have the right to vote, the ability to create their government. Now we created this United States government under this fundamental document, the U.S. Constitution. But popular sovereignty, besides allowing the citizens, the people, to create their government, give the people the power to alter their government. We have a presidential system of government. Could we change it to a parliamentary system like England or Canada? 
it would be up to the American people if the American people wanted to change our institutions of government and go from a presidential system with a, two legislative chambers, how could they do it? They would have to amend the Constitution in some fashion. They would have to change the Constitution. But do the people have the sovereignty, the authority to do that? Absolutely. It's never been done. We created our more perfect union and, uh, well, during the Civil War, the southern states wanted to break apart that more perfect union and Abraham Lincoln was able to preserve the union and the constitutional arrangement created when our Constitution was adopted. He fought to preserve and protect the Constitution and the political system that was created under it. It's not rocket science. If you put it together right, you say, okay, I get it. Now, beside the ultimate authority to create a government, to change a government or to alter a government, popular sovereignty gives you, the citizens, the right to abolish your government, overthrow it by force if necessary. Has that ever been done? No. I mean, our, our political system, this constitution, this fundamental law has lasted for how many years? Okay, 1789? the present day. The more perfect union has endured with one major exception, the Civil War, which was its biggest threat. Okay. Governments, political systems are created by the people to serve the people to promote democratic ends and values which are the foundation of our constitution and democratic political system. Any questions? New concept right here. Now, what's the sec second, oh let me go back one, one minute here, one minute. Um, if you look at page one, I use this packet not only for American government, but I use this packet when I'm talking and teaching state and local government. Look on this front page. You see where it says the Constitution of the United States? Above that it says what? The Constitution of what? New York State. Okay, the Constitution of New York State is the fundamental legal document for New York State, the highest legal document there is. Look at the preamble to the New York State Constitution. <coughs> what does it say? We the, we the people of the state of New York, grateful to Almighty God for our freedom in order to secure its blessings, do establish this Constitution. If you were to read that sentence, what's the concept? Popular sovereignty. We the people of New York create the New York State Constitution. Yes? Couldn't technically someone say they're kind of forcing religion on someone because they're saying Almighty God? What happens if you live in New York but don't believe in God? Well, then you don't believe in God. That's the, that's the only value that they mention in their preamble, right? Yeah. God. Look at the preamble of the United States. Doesn't mention religion, does it? But it mentions justice, domestic tranquility, promote the general welfare, national defense, and freedom. Uh, I don't know. I, you know what I may do? Maybe I'll go online and get the preamble to the California Constitution. The yellow, we'll see what they say in those constitutions. But this is the U.S. Constitution. Again, the point I want to make is popular sovereignty in a democratic political system. Authority flows from us. We create the institutions of government, the branches. We give the, the, the elected leaders or the appointed judges are given the authority to make these decisions, these legitimate decisions, the authoritative allocation of values for society because we have given them the authority. Okay, any questions or comments? What else 
does the United States Constitution do? Oh no, let, let me let me stay on page one. Let me let me just go back um, to the ends of government and democratic values. On page one, what's the thirteenth amendment to the Constitution? Slavery. Read that. Read, read that. Neither slavery nor involuntary servitude except as punishment for crime or of the party shall have been duty convicted shall exist within the United States or any place subject to their jurisdiction. Thirteenth Amendment abolished slavery. <coughs> what value was being promoted? What value did have I written there? Equality. Equality. All of a sudden, we ended a system of slavery and promoted equality among blacks by amending our Constitution. So you will find some democratic values in the preamble, and then also, all of a sudden, you start to say, well, what about these amendments? 13th Amendment, 14th Amendment, 15th Amendment came after what? The Civil War. We preserved the more perfect union, and now the political system is going to amend the Constitution to promote certain democratic values, equality. Anthony, read Article 14, where it says 1868. That's when that amendment... Now follow along, because again, I give you this, you can take your notes on here, and all of a sudden, I'm giving you my lecture on the board, and it's here. My lecture flows from what I've given you, so that, and again, folks, when you have your first in-class exam, first question, what is a political system? Discuss all the key characteristics of a political system. Second question, what is the Constitution? What does the Constitution do? You've got it. You've got things you can pick out and do your own outline from what I've handed out, out to you. Uh, now, uh, read that, please. All persons born and naturalized in the United States and subject to the jurisdiction thereof are citizens of the United States and of the state wherein they, they reside. The United States shall make or enforce any law which shall abridge the privileges or immunities of citizens of the United States. Okay, stop right there. Good, thank you. 13th <coughs> Amendment ended slavery. It ended a system based on inequality. Next Amendment, 14th Amendment, gives all the freed black slaves citizenship. They were now United States citizens. Expanding or promoting the value of citizenship and equality. We ended slavery, and then we said all of those freed slaves that had achieved what? Liberty, remember that freedom? Remember that word freedom? Now we're citizens and had the same rights and privileges as the white citizens. So you say to myself, my God, look at this document. Uh, expanding freedom, ending slavery. Go to the top part of this page, the Declaration of Independence. Of course, the Declaration of Independence was before the Constitution. What does the Declaration of Independence say? Let me read the important part of this introduction to the De uh, Declaration of Independence. About midway in that segment, we hold these truths to be self-evident. That all men are created what? Equal. Were blacks equal? No. Were American Indians equal? Here's the Declaration of Independence talking about this democratic value of equality. And yet when we created our Constitution, we had inequality built into it. We had the value of all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creators with certain unalienable rights, and among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Now here's the Declaration talking about life liberty in the pursuit of happiness. All men are created equal. But blacks were, were unequal. Blacks didn't have the freedoms. 
But the notion that these values were important, and when you look at the sweep of American history and our Constitution and how our Constitution was amended, are we, have we expanded equality in this country? Yeah. Absolutely. From the Declaration of Independence, from the Constitution being adopted until today, the value of equality has been expanded and expanded and expanded. Now, let's see. Uh, <coughs> look at the fifth article, Elizabeth. Down at the bottom of the page, read. They use articles. I like amendments. But, okay, so article 15. Read that, please. Right down here, bottom of the page. The right of citizens of the United States to vote shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or by any state on account of race, color, or per previous conditions of vote. Folks, what did we do at the end of the Civil War? We freed the slaves and ended slavery. We gave them citizenship. And what did we give them in the amendment you just read? We gave them what? Popular sovereignty. Right? There you go. All of a sudden, blacks, through the constitutional amendments, we were expanding equality and popular sovereignty, the right to vote. Remember back when our country was founded, you know who had popular sovereignty? White, rich men. It was limited. Popular sovereignty was limited. Have we expanded popular sovereignty and thus equality? Uh, okay. Uh, go to the second column on page one. Let's see. The 19th article. Alicia, you got that? The 19th article? Oh, yeah. yeah, read that 19th article. What was the year? Well, I don't even know the year. It doesn't have it there, but it was about 1917, 1918. Go ahead. The right of citizens of the United States to vote shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or by any state on account of the Oh my God, we gave women the right to vote. We gave blacks their freedom. We gave blacks citizenship, and we gave blacks the right to vote. And finally, at about 1917, 1918, we said, well, maybe women should be as equal as men, and we should give them popular sovereignty. Were we expanding democratic values? Women now became equal in the political sense because they finally got the ultimate authority. I mean, it's amazing. You think of these things, and that's why I like to use these concepts. You know, the, what, the right to vote. How important? I mean, it, it's fundamental to a democracy. All the authority in a democracy rests with the people. But what did we do? For a long period of time, we said blacks, you know, American Indians, women. And so, I, again, was the system becoming more democratic? through these constitutional amendments. Yes, because we're expanding what we consider to be our true democratic values. Yes? So did the 15th Amendment only allow African-American males to vote? Yes. Okay. Yes. Now, go to the uh, 24th Amendment. Or no, go to, uh, go to the 26th Amendment. Danielle, 26th Amendment. Read that, please. The right of citizens of the United States who are 18 years of age or older to vote shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or by any state on account of age. Ooh. What did we expand, Danielle? Popular sovereignty to you. When I was growing up, you had to be 21 to vote. All of a sudden, they passed this amendment. My God! And one of the arguments was what? You could serve in the military at 17, 18, 19, go off to war and get killed, but you couldn't vote. I mean, the ultimate authority to be part of the political system. 
So look at these amendments. And what have we done? We've expanded equality and popular sovereignty. Equality and popular sovereignty. You know what? We probably could, if we wanted to amend the Constitution, reduce the voting age to 70 or 60. But right now, the Constitution, as the fundamental law of the land, has stipulated 18. Some states allow their state citizens to vote at 17, but only in what? State elections. So that can be done. Um, do I want to do that right now? I'll come back to the bottom of it says, the Congress shall have the power to enforce this article by appropriate legislation. What do you think that means? Like, so I feel like they can make a law about it, but how do they have to put that in the Constitution? Because what they are saying, when they, that's, a good, that's a good question. The Congress shall have power to enforce this article by appropriate legislation. The amendment says to Congress, as our lawmaking body, if you feel you have to pass laws that make this amendment effective, Congress can pass laws to make sure that this amendment is being fulfilled. And they, uh, if you go back, you will see that in most cases, after every amendment, it has that Congress shall have the power to do such and such. Okay. Um, go down to the Gettysburg Address at the bottom of the page. See, and you have the benefit of all my notes. I write all these notes, so and you should. You don't have to think too much. You'll say, well, there's the concept. Four score and seven years ago, our, our fathers brought forth upon this continent a new nation conceived in what? Liberty. There's that liberty again. What, what do we mean? That, that democratic value of liberty, <laughs> conceived in liberty, and dedicated to the proposition that what? All men are created equal. Remember the Declaration of Independence? All men are created equal. Well, Hey, you know, hey, there's Abe Lincoln talking about liberty and equality. A nation conceived based on what? The ends of government. We are, now we are engaged in a great civil war, testing whether the nation or any nation so conceived and so dedicated can long endure. Okay, jump down to the last paragraph to the very end under God have a new birth of freedom and that government of the people by the people for the people shall not perish from the earth popular sovereignty okay over and over and over again kind of historically starting if you will with the declaration of independence and moving through the Constitution forming a more perfect union uniting the American people, setting forth various fundamental democratic ends, values, and one of them being this popular sovereignty. Okay, turn the page. Any questions? major function performed by the Constitution. Look at article, you see, you have, and this is my Xerox, I kind of patched this together. What does article one say? Read that. All legislative powers herein granted shall be vested in a Congress of the United States which shall consist of a Senate and House of Representatives. Okay, stop. Uh, Marianne, Article 2. Read Article 2, Section 1. Right there. The executive power shall be vested in a President of the United States of the America. He shall hold his office during the terms of four years and together with the Vice President 
chosen from the same term be elected as models. Okay, uh, Adam. Article 3 at the bottom, section 1. The judicial power of the United States shall be, best, be vested in one Supreme Court and such inferior courts as the Congress may from time to time ordain and establish. Okay, good. That's, that's enough. What is the Constitution of the United States doing in Article 1, Article 2, and in Article 3? <coughs> the sections that were read. Creating what? Creating the institutions of government, <coughs> the legislative, the executive, and the judicial. Okay? So the three institutions or branches of government are created. And if you look on page two, right after the preamble, Constitution starts talking about the legislative branch of government. Article 1 deals with the legislative branch of government. Article 2 deals with the presidency or the executive branch of government. Article 3 deals with what? The judicial branch of government. Now if let's see I don't But if you were to go into Article 1 that deals with the, and it's creating what? A bicameral legislature, a House and the Senate, two branches, not one legislative chamber, <coughs> but two legislative branches or institutions of our national government. If you were to get into this segment, you would deal with the House of Representatives first, and you would see such things as, how old do you have to be to be a member of the House of Representatives? 25. How old do you have to be to be a senator? 30. Okay? It starts setting forth in detail qualifications. Who can be a member of the House? Based on, you have to be a U.S. citizen, you have to be, if you're a senator from New York, you have to live within the state. You have to be a resident for seven years, I think, for the House, nine years for uh, the Senate, uh, 14 years for the President of the United States. So all of these legal uh, aspects are in there. Yes? So if, like, you live in New York, but you also, like, say you lived in California and you moved back and forth, like your mom lives in New York, your dad lives in California, could you technically become senator or house rep for both those you, states? You, ha you are a resident of a particular state and people have to really declare residency. Uh -huh. And they go by your driver's license, where do you vote from? If you're a New Yorker, you're going to have a New York driver's license, pay New York taxes, uh, own property in New York, vote in New York. Yeah, if you switch back and forth, and uh, you say, well, I, I live here three months a year, I would, no, the, the, the legal legal requirements. So, any questions? We establish, and, and uh, what else does the Constitution deal with when it comes to the legislative branch, let's say? How many, how many senators from each state? Two. We now have, what, 100 senators. When we formed a more perfect union, William, we had 13 states, 26 senators. As I told you, what happens if we add Puerto Rico as the 51st state? Can we say, by law, oh, we're only going to give the Puerto Rican new state one senator? We don't have enough room in the Senate chamber. We only have room for one more. Thus, Puerto Rico, you are now a state, but you can only have one senator. The Constitution says two, <laughs> and there will be two. Okay. How many? How many members today? The House of Representatives. Four thirty-five. Four thirty-five. Good. Some of you re retained that from that first exercise. <coughs> by law, in 1918, by law, Congress passed a law saying that we will not have any more 
members of the House of Representatives were capping it at 435. Congress passed the law because there's nothing in the Constitution that says how many representatives from New York, how many representatives from Virginia. It was all based on what? Population. population. Good. The larger states with the larger population, <coughs> the more representatives in Congress. What's the largest state in the nation population? California. California. I think they have 55 members of the House of Representatives. How many in New York State? 29. Good. When I was in college, you know how many members we had in the House of Representatives from New York? I think it was 45. What's happened? You look at it going back to 1920, and every 10 years, because every 10 years we do what? We take census. a census, and we say, this state, Florida, this state, Texas, has gained population. <coughs> New York has lost population. Michigan has lost population. We know what's going to happen. When we have the election in uh, 2012, I think it will be, uh, New York could go down to 28. Texas could gain one. Some states will remain equal. Okay, But that's all that's in the Constitution. We can't change that unless we want to change this fundamental law. Yes. So um, which, Greg, right? No, Kyle. Kyle, okay. So where would they take it from if Puerto Rico became a state? Well, they would get two senators automatically. Yeah, but I mean for the House of Representatives, who uh, would they take their Good question. Good, good, good question. Uh, I don't know. I don't know. Here, here's, here's what they may do. Based on the population, I said by law, established in about 1918, I think, they decided that they didn't want more than 435 representatives. Why? The House chamber was only so large, and that was one of the major reasons. They said, oh my God, you know, as we were adding new states, they kept adding and adding and adding until they said, we can't have 545 members of the House of Representatives. We don't have enough room in the House chamber. So they locked it in by law. What they might be able to do is say, based on the population, you would, let's say you should have three members of the House. They might change the law and go from 435 to 438. Okay. So, but it's all in the Constitution. When we talk about these things, you say, this is written into this fundamental law. And that's the way it is. Okay, uh, let's see. Now, Article 1, Section 1. All legislative <coughs> powers. What does that mean? How long is it? It's rulemaking. Absolutely. Remember the concept of rulemaking? The branch of government that is thought of as the rulemaking or lawmaking branch of government is the legislature. Is the legislature. <laughs> Congress established the institutions or branches of government and set forth basic procedures for each branch of government. Now, remember it's a bicameral legislature. The primary activity is rulemaking. What else does the Constitution do besides <coughs> engage in lawmaking? Do they have a role in amending the Constitution? You're going to find that out when you do that assignment on how can the United States Constitution be amended. You're going to find out that the House and the Senate play a critical role. They have a constitutional role to play. How about treaty making? What branch of government is involved in treaties, confirming treaties? Well, yeah, the Senate only. If we're talking about treaties, the House has no legislative role to play. It's the Senate must ratify a treaty submitted by the President of the United States. Okay. Now, as the three institutions of government are being created by our Constitution, 
What is the Constitution almost doing simultaneously? <coughs> This is interesting. What is the Constitution doing as it is creating the three branches of government? The legislative, the executive, and the judicial. Checks and balances. Not yet. Brittany. You with me? Okay, Brittany. Read section one of Article One. All legislative powers herein which shall be vested in the Congress of the United States, which shall consist of a Senate and House of Representatives. So the House and the Senate give what get what power? Uh, legislative power. Legislative power. Hmm. Brittany, read Article Two, Section One. Executive power, uh, the executive power shall be given to a president. Read section three at the bottom, Brittany. You're doing well. The judicial power of the United States shall be vested in one Supreme Court. Continue. And in such inferior courts as the Congress may from time to time ordain and stop. Good. Establish. Look. Here's this Constitution establishing the three branches of government and then <coughs> assigning each branch general constitutional authority or power. Ask yourself, what is the legislative authority? What does it allow the Congress to do? Brittany did well. What is the executive power? We know it's given to the president. But what does it mean? It's a general grant of constitutional authority. The president is considered to be what? The chief executive. To take care that the laws be faithfully executed. And then Brittany says, all judicial power. Look at that last part there, Article 3. The judicial power of the United States shall be vested in what? One Supreme Court. It's the only court that was created by the Constitution. We had the Supreme Court. No other district courts, courts of appeal below it. Where did all those other courts come from? Read what it says. Okay? One Supreme Court and in such inferior courts as the Congress may create from time to time. Congress, through its lawmaking or legislative powers, created a whole judicial system. General grants of power. What are the general grants of power? Legislative, executive, and judicial. <coughs> Any questions or comments? Now, we still, yes? How long does it take to like to get to the Supreme Court. Oh boy, uh, sometimes years and years. Uh, it, depending, it depends on the case. Sometimes the Supreme Court, the Supreme Court is a court of appeals. It's not a trial court. The district courts are trial courts. And most issues, if there's a legal dispute, if someone uh, files a lawsuit, like, the, um, uh, let's see. Where's that argument? If you read this article on the lesbian Air Force official who challenged the don't ask, don't tell law, she started out in district court, in the federal court, issued a ruling. That can be appealed to the Court of Appeals and then eventually to the Supreme Court of the United States. The trial court, here's the case, here's the pros and cons. They make the first decision is made at a trial court level. That's rule adjudication. But then, the losing party has the legal right to appeal it, and the final court that you can appeal to is the Supreme Court if they take the case. We'll get into that when we deal with the courts. But the court, remember, the courts, through judicial review and judicial decision making, can authoritatively allocate values for society. That's what they're hoping for here. I was going to go over this one. I may go over it in class today. 
to show you how I picked out certain concepts that one of which is judicial review, rule adjudication, and the authoritative allocation of values for society. Okay, now, what did I write here? <coughs> if, you're, if you're answering this question as an exam question, you can say, Dr. Pizak, the U.S. Constitution establishes the branches of government, legislative, judicial, uh, uh, and uh, executive, uh, president, uh, the House and the Senate, a bicameral legislature, and when it's establishing those branches of government, it, it grants each of the branches of government general constitutional power or authority. And you might say the general power or the constitutional authority is what? Legislative power, executive power, and judicial power. That gives you some understanding. Remember, remember the term separation of powers? Legend, there you go. Separation of powers. And we, separate, we separate the institutions any number of ways, but that's <coughs> one way. We say, here's a source of power legislative, here's a source of power executive, and here's a source of power judicial. Now, now, what else does the Constitution do besides granting general constitutional Look on this page, page two, uh, section two, last paragraph in <coughs> section two. Stephanie, read the last paragraph in article one, section two. Um, where it says the house? Yes, the House of Representatives shall choose their speaker and other officers and shall have the sole power of impeachment. Okay, what did Stephanie just read? The House shall choose the what? Speaker. Speaker. You mean we had a speaker when we had our first House of Representatives? Who's the speaker today? Nancy Pelosi. That is a specific, specific grant of constitutional power given to the House of Representatives that they can choose their speaker. If the Republicans take control of the House of Representatives in this election, who do you think will be Speaker of the House? Minority Leader. Minority Leader, the Minority Leader of the Republicans, John Boehner. Remember I asked you that question? John Boehner's the minority leader. The Republicans are in the minority. If the Republicans become the majority party, the House shall choose its speaker, and that's the majority party that will make that decision. Now, they have to choose him, though. Pardon? Would they have to choose him, per se? No. The Republicans, if they become the majority party, normally would select their minority leader, but they don't have to. They could select someone else. Now, what other specific, so that's one specific power given to the House of Representatives to choose their speaker. What is the next in that same little sentence that Stephanie read and shall have the power of what? Impeachment. Impeachment. Is that a check and a balance? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Now, was Bill Clinton impeached? No. Oh, no, yes. Bill Clinton was impeached by the House of Representatives. This is okay. And uh, the House of Representatives voted to impeach the president. But the House's role is to act almost as a grand jury. The House of Representatives has the sole power to impeach. The House acted first. They heard the evidence against Bill Clinton, and they said, you know what? We think there's enough evidence And we're going to impeach Bill Clinton, and then there will be a trial where? That's a great word. Okay. Okay. Just, okay, you, you don't know. Jump down. Stephanie, I'm going to have you do this one more time. Stephanie, section three. Third paragraph where it says the Senate shall have... The sole power to try all impeachments. Okay. Here. You hit, 
two branches of government, the House and the Senate, a bicameral. Again, okay, look, oh. Concept. <coughs> You're reading an article and it says the bill passed the House and is now going to be voted on in the Senate. You're going to say bicameral legislature. Okay? Here's what happened. <coughs> Bill Clinton, the House of Representatives used its impeachment power per the Constitution, Article 1. Once the House of Representatives says that we think there's enough evidence that Bill Clinton engaged in behavior that maybe we should remove him from office, they voted in the House of Representatives, and when they voted to impeach the president, it was now up to the Senate with its constitutional authority to hear the case against Bill Clinton, just as a jury would hear a case in a court of law. The Senate becomes a jury. So let me read what Stephanie was reading. The Senate shall have the sole power to try. Circle the word try. Impeachment is done in the House. If the House votes to impeach, the trial, I call it a trial, it is like a trial. It's a legislative trial by the Senate. It goes to the Senate. When sitting for that purpose, they shall be on oath or affirmation. When the President of the United States is tried, the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court will preside. When Bill Clinton, when that went to the Senate, the Chief Justice of the United States at that time was Bill Rehnquist. He came to the Senate in his official judicial robes, and he was the presiding officer. He conducted the Senate's role. Okay. What did the Senate do? Now, let me, let me go on. When the, no person shall be convicted without the concurrence of what? Two thirds. How many senators? 100 senators? You need a two thirds of 100. It wasn't a simple majority. We want to make it difficult. We don't want the legislature to, uh, let, let's say the Republicans win the House and the Senate, you still got Obama, the Democrat. You don't want to give the House and the Senate the power to, the House of Representatives says we're going to impeach him, we're going to, we're going to impeach him in the House, send it over to the Senate, and all you need is 51 votes. What if the Republicans had 60 votes? So two thirds is tough. You know what happened? A number of Republicans said, we're not going to support, we're not going to vote to impeach him. And the Republicans and uh, uh, almost all Democrats supported not to convict. So President Clinton was, was tried and they didn't impeach him. Now, if they had impeached him, what's the punishment? Jail. Removal from office. That's it. He leaves. He's removed from office. The vice president would be kind of waiting right there, <coughs> not knowing what it was in store for him. Okay. Does the president know if he's on trial for impeachment? Oh yeah, I mean, they. I was on television. I I've got tapes and tapes of um, Richard Nixon and Bill Clinton, and and they televised uh, a great deal of this. Now let me give you one more example. The House of Representatives. And when we get to that segment, I'll, I'll bring you the articles of impeachment from the House of Representatives. The House of Representatives impeached Richard Nixon. After the House impeached Richard Nixon, what was going to happen? They were going to have a trial where? The Senate. If you read the history of, of that impeachment, Richard Nixon was on the phone calling all of these Republican senators. Are you going to vote to convict me, or are you going to vote not to convict me? Uh, and you know what Richard Nixon found out? That a lot of members of his own party were going to vote to convict him in the Senate. Along with the Democrats, they would have had two-thirds vote, and Richard Nixon would have been convicted in the Senate, and what? 
removed from office. What did he do? Resigned. The only president in the history of the United States to resign because he did not want to be the first president of the United States ever to be convicted in the Senate and removed from office. So he said, I got two lousy choices here, right? Uh, so he just resigned. Who became president? Gerald Ford, the vice president, became president. Now, any questions so far? What are we talking about? Uh, also, if you look in Article 1, Section 3, oh, there's the qualifications. Yeah, look at the, the second paragraph down in Section 3. No person shall be a senator who shall not have attained the age of 30, been nine years a citizen of the United States, and who shall not, when elected, be the inhabitant of the state for which he shall be chosen. Okay, and if you go back up to Section 2, you'll see the qualifications for the House. Okay. Um, middle paragraph. Roxanne. Middle paragraph of page 2, where it says procedure in passing bills and resolutions. Now, you know that this is going to deal with what concept? Rulemaking. Specific grant of power. Who can make the rules? We know it's going to be the House and the Senate, right? Because they've been given the legislative power. But when we get to this segment or section of the Constitution, it spells out the process for legislation or rulemaking. The process. Who are the key participants in this legal constitutional process? Uh, go ahead, read the second paragraph. Beginning with the second paragraph, Roxanne. Every bill which shall pass the House of Representatives and the Senate shall be forwarded to the law, be presented to the President of the United States. If he approve, he shall sign it, but if not, he shall receive it with his objections to the House in which it shall have. Okay, stop. What is the rulemaking, lawmaking process? The bill has to pass the House, right? has to pass the Senate. Then it must go to the President. And this is why the, the actual terminology is a bill in the House and the Senate. If it passes the House and the Senate, a bill, it becomes law only when it's signed into law by the President. So a bill becomes a what? A law when the President signs it into law. Who's involved in the process, Roxanne? The House and the Senate and the President. Now, what if the Senate passes a law and the House doesn't? It's, it's, it's done. It's done. One House can, let's say the Democrats keep control of the House and the Republicans get control of the Senate. And the House passes these bills and they go to the Republican Senate and the Republican Senate says, we're not going to pass this. The President has nothing to sign. It doesn't become law. A bill becomes a law only when it passes the House and the Senate and it is signed into law by the President. The process. Remember I keep talking about the process? What parts of the system play, uh, carry out key functions given the process? Now, if the President doesn't sign it, what happens? He can veto it. He must send the veto message back to the House and the Senate because this section of the Constitution says that the House and the Senate can attempt to override the President's veto. Is this checks and balances? If the House passes a bill and the Senate doesn't, the Senate checks the House. If the House passes a bill and the Senate passes the bill and it goes to the President and the President vetoes it, the President checks the legislative branch. The veto goes back to the House and the Senate and if they vote to override the veto, they've checked the President. So they yes. Three fourths. Pardon? So they need three fourths. Uh, what does it say? It's two thirds, I think. It's two-thirds. Okay, any questions or comments? What have I been talking about? Impeachment, choosing a speaker, and also in the Senate, they can choose their own leaders. I, and I've talked about general constitutional authority, and I've now just been talking about what? Specific. Okay, I'm going to stop there because I want to get some of this other material that I hope will help you with your journal. Now, remind me when we meet <coughs> today. Uh, what
when we meet on Tuesday that I left off right here. Because I want, and again, look, folks, please bring this with you, because this next section I'm going to get into specific, more specific grants of authority. This is very important. You've got to have this. So it's like the uh, legislative and stuff still gets in the part of the preamble? Because no, the preemptive preamble, <coughs> It's, it's the opening statement of the Constitution, okay? And the preamble deals with symbolic values. Why we are creating government. What do we want government to do? Then, what, then where do we go? Then we start to create the institutions of government. We want our institutions of government to carry out these ends that are set, some of the ends are set forth in the preamble, other ends are set forth throughout the, the uh, amendments to the Constitution. Okay. Okay. Turkish Constitution. Hey, you mean the Turks have a constitution? Do they have a political system? Yeah. With national boundaries, system boundaries? Well, this is the fundamental law of the Turkish political system. And I, I found this very interesting. Now, I'm going to start reading. I want you to follow along because Kayla, I might say, Kayla, what's the concept? Or I may say, Dan, what's the concept? However, I'm trying to get you, as you're reading a sentence or two, or I'm reading a sentence or two, you say, what concept could I apply to that sentence? Are you with me? Turkish voters, popular sovereignty, absolutely. Turkish voters, popular sovereignty. That's exactly what I want you to do. Good, Anthony. Approved a sweeping package of constitutional reforms by, by a wide margin on Sunday, handing a major victory to the Islamic-rooted government that continued the country's uh, inexorable shift in power away from the secular Western elite that has governed modern Turkey for most of its history. Beside popular sovereignty, what might you put there? It's not leadership selection because they did not elect any leaders. They changed their constitution. It would be interest identification. A majority of voters supported these constitutional amendments. They went to the polls. They voted on them at the polls. They used their popular sovereignty to adopt what they considered to be reform amendments. See, I mean, all of a sudden, this is, you've got to be thinking this way. The changes were intended to bring Turkey's military imposed constitution in line with European standards of law and democracy. What might you use when you read law? Rulemaking. Good. Good, Pam. Rulemaking. If you see the word bill, if you see the word treaty, if you see the word legislation, if you see the word statute, I'm going to, I'll write this down for you. It's rulemaking. Okay? And then there's what? Democracy. I said our constitution is a constitution for a democratic political system. Turkey wants to move toward democracy and the values of democracy. Okay, a second paragraph, according to unofficial returns issued, the package of 26 constitutional amendments passed with 58% of the vote. Here I would put interest identification. You could put popular sovereignty again. The yes verdict in today's referendum is the result of our nation's longing for democracy. Mr. Egerdin told the country in a live televised broadcast, punctuated by outbursts of his supporters chanting, Turkey is proud of you. I also there would put the authoritative allocation of values for society someplace in there. Because this, this is a big deal in Turkey. This, this is a big deal. 
big deal. The people with their popular sovereignty have decided to adopt what they consider to be constitutional reforms that will move their political system toward democracy and democratic values. Uh, middle, or that second column, last paragraph, the main message out of the ballot boxes is that our nation said yes to advanced democracy, yes to freedom, yes to the supremacy of law, not the law of superiors, and yes to the sovereignty of our nation. Now, let's go to the middle paragraph, and I'm just going to read one more paragraph. Middle column. Analysts said the vote popular sovereignty again. Remember I told you you can use this any number of times. If you say to yourself, well I used popular sovereignty once already, how many times I should, should I use it? Just just put the P-O-P-S. If, if, it's, if it's there, put it. Get used to identifying it. If you identify it five times and you do it right every single time, that's fine. Now, Analysts said the vote would boast the government's prospects for win winning re-election next spring. Concept. Leadership selection. They're finally used leadership selection. Okay. Uh, now remember, I'm going to stop this one. You can't use this article for a journal entry because I'm, I'm going over it in class. Now, I'm going to go over one more. Consumer candidate might, might may avoid the Senate vote. Same page, you with me? The Obama administration is considering appointing the legal scholar Elizabeth Warren to run a new consumer bureau on a temporary basis to avoid potentially bruising confirmation battle in the Senate according to people who have been briefed on the search concept. Leadership selection, not through the electoral process, but through the appointment process. Now, again, who has the power to nominate? What branch must confirm? The Senate. The President doesn't think he can get it through the Senate. He wants her, but the Republicans in the Senate say, we'll filibuster. Get so he's trying to work around the role of the Senate to confirm. He's not going to officially nominate her. She's going to just get this position for a period of time. That's what it's all about. The Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, centerpiece of the Dodd-Frank Wall Street regulatory overhaul law, rule <coughs> making. You could put interest identification. What's, what's the president trying to do? make an end run around the appointment process. <coughs> Interest identification, okay, director. Now look at what, this law that was passed, this Dodd-Frank law that Obama signed in June, we just talked about the president signing the bill in the law, right? It's the law. And why did they pass this consumer protection law? and want to create this new administrative structure? Because they wanted to prevent abuse, deceptive and fraudulent terms for mortgages, credit cards, pay loans, and a vast array of other financial products. The authoritative allocation of values for society. This law wanted to prevent abuses when people get loans and credit cards and what have you. Now you can go through this, uh, boy, rulemaking several times uh, through this. Okay, any questions or comments? Now look, I have given you two articles from the New York Times today that you must use for your next two journal entries after the, the first one. However, I did not talk about these today, so if you like the one on the fact that France has banned the burqa and want to do a journal entry on that, be my guest. The political system of France. There's another one, challenger from Tea Party wins key Delaware race. You can do that one. 
And I haven't even talked about don't ask, don't tell, you can do that one. Okay, have a good weekend. Oh yes, you know what I want you to do? When you hand in your journal,